will. And we'll get started. And um, We're down now to verse number 14. And King Herod heard of him, for his name was spread abroad. And he said that John the Baptist was risen from the dead, and therefore mighty works do show forth themselves in him. Now, what happens here? We've just come out of verse number 12 and 13, where the Lord has sent the disciples out. Uh, and they went out and preached that men should repent, and they cast out many devils and appointed and, and anointed with oil many that were sick and healed them. So we've come to a point here where the Lord has gone back up to Nazareth because of their unbelief. He wasn't able to have the productive ministry he was trying to. And so he turns and he sends out the twelve, verse seven and eight. They go out, they're preaching and teaching in uh, the face of the unbelief. And you don't give up, you just keep going. And that's what the Lord's doing. That's what he's teaching the little flock to do. And now, from verse 14 down to verse 29, you get this little strange, uh, hey, come, in and, come on in, the water's hot. I mean, the water's fun. It's fine. So when you, when you come in here into Mark 6 now, from verse 14 to 29, you come into a passage where Mark puts in this interesting uh, little caption here about Herod and John the Baptist and the death of John and everything. And really a lot of people kind of struggle with it. And because why is it here? Why does he do it here? Because you just, if you look at verse 13, 12 and 13, and they went out and preached that men should repent. And they cast out many devils and anointed with oil many that were sick and healed them. And if you look across to verse 30, And the apostles gathered themselves together unto Jesus and told him all things, both what they had done and what they had taught. So you've got verse 14, and King Herod, and verse 15, and others, that it is Elias, and others, and when Herod and his John, and he's raised from the dead, and all this. But for, there's a connection there's a hook here between verse 13 and verse 30. Verse 12 and 13, he sends them out. Verse 30, they come back and give a report. But in stuck in between them is this account here with Herod and uh, John the Baptist, and it details how Herod beheaded John, why he did it, who was there, and so forth. And, and again, verse 30, they're getting together recapping the Lord sends them out. Now they're recapping, but stuck right in between them, Mark does here, is this just kind of an oddball thing here about Herod and John the Baptist and so forth. And really, it's not oddball at all. Uh, nothing in Scripture is done just on a whim. There's a purpose and so forth. But usually, again, this passage troubles people because it is. He sends them out to do the ministry. Then they're going to give a recap, verse 30, and then stuck right in the middle is this kind of a different thing here. And Mark is the one that does this here. If you go Matthew and Luke and so forth, it's there, but it's not done in such great detail here. There is a, <laughs> there is a connection here between the, the, the murder of John the Baptist and the the mission of the little flock now, the 12, as they go out. And there's going to be a connection here. We'll see that there is a reason for the, Mark sticking this account right here the way he does. They're going to go out, and they're going to be facing um, unbelief. And they're going to be facing unbelief from the religious standpoint. Uh, they're in verse... Uh, uh, five, uh, well, verse uh, well, verse four. But Jesus said unto them, A prophet is not without honor, but in his own country, among his own kin, and in his own home. He goes in, verse six, because of their unbelief. He marvels. He can't do. And as he looks at their unbelief, he sees that religious system, that vain religious system here. They don't want to hear the word of God. The Jews don't. 
Okay, but now when he brings up Herod, now we're in the politics. Now we're in the government. Now we're in society. So there's going to be, there's a connection here where he's taking that little flock, that believing remnant, the 12, and he's letting them know, listen, you're going to face opposition from the religious crowd, but you're also going to face opposition from the politicians, from the social scene as well. He'll, He'll talk about the Pharisees and the Sadducees and then the Herodians. Here they are. The liberals will get you, the conservatives are going to get you, and then the politicians are going to get you. And that's literally what's happening here. You'll notice verse 14, And King Herod heard of him. You see Herod here. Now, this is Herod the boy, not Herod the dad. Uh, Matthew 14, he's called Herod the Tetrarch. And that word Tetrarch means a quarter ruler of a dominion. He's not the main man. He's got a quarter of the realm. <laughs> he is only over the, the, this area of the Middle East. He, uh, in Matthew uh, 2, where the wise men show up, that's Herod the Great. That's his dad. This is Herod the Tetrarch. This is, this is the boy who takes over. Now, Herod the Great, he's over all the area And when he dies, they break it up. And this is literally Herod of Antipas when you get into the Roman uh, history lessons. And again, in Rome, you you can go in and look at the the historical records of Rome and you find these people. That's what makes your Bible so tremendously wonderful is it's sitting literally in history. And now this Herod here, He ruled over the area from 4 B.C. all the way through about 36 A.D. So all of the life of Christ, he was in charge. So when you see him go in uh, several years ago, people were talking to me about the Dead Sea Scrolls and all this stuff and how it's wonderful. You know that the Dead Sea Scrolls at 99.9% of the time match your King James Bible? They don't let you know that. They make it off into some... But in all of that discovery, they've discovered in the archaeology digs over there, Caiaphas' house, where they take the Lord and do and go through the... They found a plaque in a section that said Caiaphas' house, the house of Caiaphas. So So it begins to match up. But what happens is, is people misunderstand why this passage is even here to begin with. And the issue, if you look there at verse, um, well, verse 14, King Herod heard of him. Now the him there obviously is the Lord. For his name was spread abroad, and he said that John the Baptist was risen from the dead, and therefore mighty works do show forth themselves in him. Others said that it is Elias, Elijah, and Others said that it is a prophet or as one of the prophets. But when Herod heard thereof, he said, It is John whom I beheaded. He is risen from the dead. So Herod here, he's the boy. He's not the king, the the big guy. He, He Actually, dad's dead at this point. But here is Herod. And we begin to get this story here of the details about John the Baptist, about Herod's involvement, Herodias. If you look down there at verse 16, I'm I'm sorry, verse 17, for Herod himself had sent forth and laid upon, hold upon John and bound him in prison for Herodias' sake, his brother's Philip, his brother Philip's wife, for he had married her. So Herod has taken his brother's wife. To bride now. By the way, his brother is not dead. Philip is alive. So what John's going to do is John stands up to him and he rebukes him. Now Herod is not a Jew. Herod's a Roman, but yet what John does is he comes in and he says, "Hey, listen, <laughs> the God of the Bible, Israel's religion, Israel's truth." impacts you and you shouldn't be doing what you're doing it's wrong for you to be in adultery it's wrong for you to take the brothers your brother's wife you are wrong and 
And so he takes God's word that God gave to Israel, and he brings it in, and he literally applies it to the to the to the political and the social environment and scene that he that's around him. Now that gets him in hot water real quick. Verse nineteen. Therefore Herodias had a quarrel against him and would have killed him, but she could not. She's going to have a fight with him. She's ready to duke it out, but she can't. <laughs> She's not in that position. So what you have here, again, as we kind of get into the passage, is you have, a, you have John the Baptist, and you have a fight that's come to John from the political, social, governmental scene. Okay? Now, John's fighting the religious scenario, but now he's also fighting on, he, he's fighting with Herod. He's telling Herod, what you're doing is wrong. It's a bad thing to take your brother's wife and make him your wife. Make her, make him. Make your, her your wife. It's bad. Knock it off. Stop it. Don't do that. But John the Baptist, he's, again, he, he's telling everybody this. Now, the Lord just sent out the 12 in verse 12 and 13, Mark 6, 12 and 13. And he sends them out, look at verse 12, and they went out and preached that men should what? Repent. Well, what was John the Baptist's message? Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. So just as John is out telling everyone that they should repent, for the kingdom is, what are the twelve doing? Same message. It's time to repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And what happened? The religious characters rejected John, but Herod took it all the way to the ultimate end, death. And what the Lord is going to do here is he's going to use this moment to, again, with the 12, with the religious, with the believing remnant, he's going to educate them. He's training them. Not only are you going to face the religious system and they're going to reject you, but you're now also going to face a political, social system that's going to reject you. And literally what begins to happen here is there is a picture of that of the end time of the book of the revelation for them this is what's coming your way you stay the course obviously in verse 30 what did they do they stayed the course they preached they give a report back to the to 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 the lord and everything is good to go so there's some things that are happening here that are literally of a picture of what's going to happen to them as they move forward okay so the mur there are three murders in Israel's history here that really are telling in the Gospels and in Acts. The murder of John the Baptist here pictures and illustrates the depravity of who was ruling Israel at this time. Now, you have to remember, the Jews are under Gentile domination. They're in the fifth course of Leviticus 26. They're not, they may have their own rulers, but they still answer to the man, Rome. Okay, they're not on their own. They're not, when when you hear them today, you know, oh, we we have our own. No, they still answer to a Gentiles. Okay, people pick 1948 and all that stuff. The Gentiles gave 1948, gave it to them, let them have it. Otherwise, they would not have it if it wasn't for the United Nations and or the League of Nations and all that stuff back there. They wouldn't have had it if it wasn't for Britain. And by the way, that's where you get the weird ideas of British Israel and all this crazy nonsense out there. No, by the way, 1948, what was God's attitude about Israel in 1948? They're just one of the nations. Because why? We're in the dispensation of grace. We've been there since Paul. Okay? But man doesn't think that way. Man thinks in the moment we got to... Why? We got to bless Israel. We got to keep Israel right. You know, send them a can of food and you're good to go. You know, no, it doesn't work that way in the eyes of God. Anyway, so the murder of John the Baptist demonstrates the depravity of, of Rome, of who's ruling Israel. 
Then you have the, the you have, so you have three murders. You have the murder of John the Baptist. You have the murder of the Lord. And then in Acts 7, you have the murder of Stephen. And what you see in those three murders is you see the progression of depravity within Israel herself. Israel allowed Herod to kill John the Baptist. They allowed him, Herod to take John, to put him in prison, and to kill him. There is no uproar in the three accounts in Matthew, Mark, and Luke by the people. There's no uproar. There's no, hey, wait a minute, he's one of our guys, let him be. Then Israel demanded that Pilate, that Rome, kill the Lord Jesus Christ. We'll have no other king but Caesar. Give us Barabbas. Take him away. They demand Rome to deal to do it. And then in Acts 7, they themselves do what? Commit the murder with Stephen. They themselves pick up the rocks and stone him. So you, you've got an allowed, a demand, and then a, a committal. So you see in that in, in all of this a deepening of their rejection, of their failure as a nation to respond positively to that message of repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And that message was spoken by John the Baptist, it was spoken by the Lord, then it was spoken by the little flock, the twelve, in the Acts period. They all preached it, they all published it, they all put it out there, they all did everything. And what did Israel do? Consistently, they rejected it. They allowed it to happen. They demanded, and then they committed it themselves. And that's literally, that's why those three murders are very important. And it's why it's here in Mark where it sits. He's sending the twelve out. You're going to face a religious opposition, but you're also going to face the political and the social environment. And I'll, you'll see why here in a minute, why I say social, okay, and of, of society. So as we go down through this little section, 14 to 29 here, uh, kind of keep all of that in the back of your mind as we go through the passage. Ver, 6, 6, uh, 14. And King Herod heard of him. Now, Herod is hearing of the fame of the Lord. What's the Lord been out doing? Preaching and healing and doing and all that. And Herod hears about him. But notice what he says in verse 16. But when Herod heard thereof, he said, It is John, whom I beheaded. He is risen from the dead. Now, when Herod hears about the Lord Jesus Christ, Notice what, how Herod's conscience gets him, okay? Con, his guilty conscience, actually it, it's his superstitious conscience because what did he say? He's risen from the dead. Now, when you think about Herod and the Lord, I'm sorry, when you think about John and the Lord, they're six months apart from each other. John was born six months earlier, Luke 1, prior to the Lord being born. They're cousins. That means that they went through life in the same element, a time-wise, of life. They have ministry going on at the same time. They have life going on at the same they're to They've lived. So for, him to sit, so for Herod to say, it's John risen from the dead, that, no, that's guilt. That's superstition. That isn't logical. It isn't rational because they were existing together at the same time. Literally, the Lord was starting his earthly ministry, and John has been going six months prior, and off we go. So it doesn't make logical sense that Christ, or that I should say that John, was raised up. So Herod, there, there's no rationale here. It's all superstition. It's all superstitious. And again, remember, Israel's warned over and over and over about necromancy. You don't talk to the dead. You don't raise the dead. You don't do it. You stay out of that. That, that. that witch of Endor stuff, you stay out of that. And yet here, 
What is Herod doing? Well, he's demonstrating that superstitious, guilty conscience. And by the way, that, that comes from a lack of doctrine, a lack of sound doctrine here. How do you know that? Well, look at verse 15. Others said that it is Elias, Elijah, and others said that it is a prophet or as one of the prophets. So there are people that have some biblical understanding because what did they just say he was? What does he say? Look over at Matthew 16. Notice the question. Now, this event is in Matthew 14. It's listed in Matthew 14. But if you come over to Matthew 16 and look there at verse uh, 14, verse 13, when Jesus came into the coast of Caesarea Philippi, he, I'm sorry, Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, saying, Whom do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? And they said, Some say that thou art John the Baptist, some Elias or Elijah, some Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. Notice, he says, hey, who did they say? And they, and they bring up the two guys, Elijah and the prophet. Come over to Malachi chapter 4. Here's why they bring up Elijah and M Moses. Um, Malachi 4. And Deuteronomy 18, Malachi 4, verse 5 first. Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet, now watch, before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. So before the great and notable day and dreadful, the great and dreadful day of the Lord, who's going to show up? Elijah. But also, Deuteronomy 18, verse number 15, the Lord thy God shall raise up unto thee a prophet, capital P, from the midst of thee, of thy brethren, like unto me, unto him ye shall hearken. Verse 18, I will raise thee up a prophet from among thy, their brethren, like unto thee, and will put my words in his mouth, and he shall speak unto them all that I shall command. What's, what, so who's going to show up? Those two witnesses. Before the great notable day of the Lord, dreadful, that dreadful day, Who's showing up? A prophet like unto Moses and Elijah. That's why the Lord would say of John that if you'd have believed, he would have been Elijah, and I would have been Mo the prophet. Well, he was the prophet, but like unto Moses. But they didn't, so John came in the what? The spirit of Elijah. That's why. So when you come back here to Mark 6, you've got people that have a little bit of Bible knowledge. Because what did they say? Well, we think he's Elijah, and some, no, I think he's the prophet like unto Moses. What does Herod say? Herod says, nope, he's a dude raised from the dead down there. So that superstition, Herod, go, the superstition, he's doing the opposite of what doctrine, Bible doctrine would have told him. At least the other guys were kind of in the ballpark, not really, but they were, you know, trying. That's why when you go over there to Acts 17 and Paul's on the Mars Hill, you look over there at Acts 17. It, it's very interesting how and what Paul says about these guys. Acts 17, he's, he's there at Athens. He's been dealing with the Epicureans and the Stoics. Um Verse number 22, Then Paul stood in the midst of Mars Hill and said, Ye men of Athens, I perceive in all things ye are too superstitious. For as I pass by and behold your devotions, I found an altar with this inscription to the unknown God. By the way, that's, the God, that's what they call the God of the Bible. The God of the Bible, that's their name for the God of the Bible, the unknown God. Whom therefore ye, what? ignorantly worship him declare i unto you you see that in ignorant no scripture no doctrine they're just doing the any many mighty mo's to cover all their bases 
But what are they? Two superstitious. So when you come back to Mark 6, and when Herod says it's John, verse 16, he's risen from, that's an, that is an, a, that is a guilty, superstitious conscience. And it's getting him. He has no sound doctrine. He's going to waffle here. He's going to, eh, okay, you know, back and forth with John. And now what's going to happen here in verse 17 and following is he's going to explain how he beheaded John, why he did it, what's going on, and what ultimately is going to come to pass is, is we'll see that it is the lust of the flesh joined with the pride of life. And with that great hatred, great greed, Hermodius is going to get him to kill John the Baptist. And again, the picture being painted here is for that little flock. You're going to, this is what you're facing as you go out there. So verse 17 again, For Herod himself had sent forth and laid hold upon John and bound him in the prison for Herodias' sake, his brother's wife, for he had married her. Why did he go get John and throw him in the prison? It wasn't that John was breaking any rules. It was because of the woman he's living with. Okay, he's living in adult in an adulterous relationship. He's over here doing it. He's with he, that lust of the flesh. Again, what's John doing? John's not sitting there. He, he's not sitting there. Hey, man, repent, change your mind. He's over there hammering away on these guys. Verse eighteen, for John had said unto Herod, "It is not lawful for thee to have thy brothers." wife that is the message that john was sending yeah but wait a minute rick he said repent but that word that issue of repenting it had a message in it and a message behind it he's telling them here's the things that need to change when you think about repenting and changing your mind that's what that word means but change your mind from what to what there's a message in that if you come over to Luke chapter 3, and just watch this, because not only is this what John's teaching, this is what the Lord's teaching, this is what the 12, the little flock, are teaching. When they, when, 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 uh, in Acts 2, when Peter goes through that whole thing about how they killed and murdered and with wicked hands just slain, and then they say, sirs, what must we do? <laughs> And he says, repent, but repent from what? About who, you just killed the Messiah. So look at Luke 3. Here's John the Baptist. You got verse uh, 2, Ananias and Caiaphas being the high priest, the word of God came unto John, the son of Zacharias, in the wilderness. And he came into all the country about Jordan, preaching the baptism of repentance for the remission of of sins and he's doing this now drop down to verse number six and all flesh shall see the salvation of god then said he to the multitude that came forth to be baptized of him O generation of vipers who hath warned you to flee from the wrath to come john is the one that coins the phrase wrath to come to come that comes from john Verse 8, bring forth therefore fruits, now watch, worthy of repentance. And begin not to say unto yourselves, we have Abraham to our father. For I say unto you that God is able of these stones to raise up children under Abraham. Notice that, fruits worthy of repentance, worthy, a lifestyle worth, worthy of the kingdom. That's what needs to be demonstrated. He isn't just saying, I mean, you think about John. He's the, he's the voice, the crier in the wilderness, and he says, repent. What's the logical question? Repent from what? What are you talking about, John? What's the deal? Well, watch verse 10. And the people ask him, saying, what shall we do then? 
what are we repenting from? <laughs> See, you thought I was calm, I was nuts for asking the question. Why? Right there. Now watch verse 11. And he answered and said unto them, He that hath two coats, let him impart to him that hath none. And he that hath meat, let him do likewise. What are you going to do? You're going to help out the less fortunate. You're not, in other words, you're not doing that, and you need to do that, and that is the fruits worthy of repentance. You want to demonstrate a change in mind about your fellow man, and, and he's going to start doing that. Verse 11, verse 12, Then came also publicans to be baptized, and said unto him, Master, what shall we do? And he said unto them, Exact no more than which is appointed you. Now you remember who the publicans are. They're the tax collectors for Rome, but they're Jews. And they're hated by the Jews because they're doing Rome's yeah, dirty work. So what, what does John tell them? If it's a penny, don't get a pound. Just take the penny. See what's happening here? It isn't just repent and believe that Christ died. No, none of that. It's, hey, we're looking for a lifestyle. I love verse 14. And the soldiers likewise, that'll be the temple guard, the guys guarding the temple, commanded of him saying, and what shall we do? And he said unto them, do violence to no man, and neither there, uh, neither Accuse any falsely and be content with your wages. Isn't that like man? I ain't getting paid enough to do with this, to deal with these people. I said that Sunday after church. I ain't getting paid enough to talk to these, you know. No, don't do that, guys, okay? Verse 15. And as the people were in expectation and all men mused in their hearts of John, whether he were the Christ or not, John answered and off he goes. Verse 19. But Herod, the tetrarch, being reproved by him for Herodias, his brother's wife, and for all the evils which Herod had done, added yet this above all, that he shut up John in the prison. And what John did was he walked right into Herod and said, you're living in adultery. Thou shalt not commit adultery. And he just hit him right between the eyeballs with it. Herod is not a Jew. He's a Gentile. But you know what? If it's good for one, it's good for everybody. And we're going to, and he just hitting everybody. And the point is, come back to Mark 6 there, is he's talking to everybody, even the king. And he's, you know what he says there to Herod? You're not in a Leviticus 8, you're not in, uh, you're not supposed to take your brother's wife because Leviticus 18 says don't do that. Your brother ain't dead. Now you can take your brother's wife when your brother's dead, but he ain't dead. Not raise up the inheritance and the, the lineage and everything, but he's not dead yet. And what you're doing is adultery. And I mean, could you imagine the, the, the audacity to walk into the king and say that? The ruler, the guy that can do what? Throw you in jail, and yet there he goes. So he's got some boldness here. And he's telling Herod, repent, change it, fix it. You can do better than that. What you're doing's wrong. It's it's not illegal, as in the Roman law but it's illegal against God's law, and so he's nailing them. So when you come back here to Mark 6, verse 19, Therefore Herodias had a quarrel against him and would have killed him, but she could not. And that, <laughs> she wants him dead, but she can't. And what you're going to see here now is you're going to see the, by the way, if he, she wanted him dead, that's the ultimate revenge, isn't it? Death. So what you're going to see here is a demonstration of her, of, of the depravity of those who are ruling Israel. And you're going to see Israel's willingness to go along with, to allow it to happen. And the reason that you see Herodias and, and the issue of the woman, the, you know, the wife, the woman, is because of what's coming their way, Revelation 2. Look over at Revelation 2. There's a connection with this. And the connection here is, is really stark when you think about it. Revelation 2, you have the seven messages to the little flock as a whole, 
when he, uh, uh, he was a just man and holy. He knows he's killing God's man. That's what he knows. He's in a predicament here. He under, now, he's going to waffle. He's going to hem and haw a little bit. And uh, he, he's not happy. If you look over at verse 26, and the king was exceeding, what? Sorry. Why? Because Herodias' daughter is going to ask for his head. And what does Herod know? He's like, man, I w- I, but for an oath, and he's going to cop out. Okay? But what happens here, by, by the way, verse 26 Yet for his oath's sake, and for their sakes which sat with him, he would not reject her. His lust won. That's what happened. He caved to the lust of the flesh. And uh, what's happening here is that lust of that flesh put him in a position of trying to figure out what's right or wrong, and he went the wrong way. So anyway, back up to verse 21. So verse 20 Herod knows who John is. It's not something of, who are you, what's going on? He's got an idea. Now in verse 21, And when a convenient day was come, and there it is. Herodias can't kill John. She's waiting for a convenient day. So you begin to see what, I- what evil does. What does it do? It waits. It watches. It plots, it plans, it's looking for an opportunity, a convenient day. That Herod on his birthday made a supper to his lords, high captain, and chief estates of Galilee. What do we have? We have a Herod day. We have a birthday. And we have a birthday celebration. It's a big day. Everybody, all... All the court is going to be there. There they are. And he's got them all in tow. And what happens, verse 22, And when the daughter of the said Herodias came in and danced and pleased Herod and them that sat with him, the king said unto the damsel, Ask of me whatsoever thou wilt, and I will give it to thee. She comes in and she dances. Now, I don't think it was singing the happy birthday song or any of that. It's a lustful dance. It, it, she's allured him, it says, came in and danced and pleased Herod. She allures him. She pleases him. And by the way, not just him, but all. I mean, if you think about the debauchery of man or what that would even have looked like, it's like, oh my goodness. She comes in, gets them all worked up, and he makes an offer. And what is his offer? Whatever you want, honey, I'll give it to you. So she looks over, and she says, it's back up now. No, what does she say? Verse 22, and when the, da- when the daughter of the, oh, the end of the verse, sorry, ask of me whatsoever thou wilt, and I will give it thee, and he swear unto her whatsoever thou shalt ask of me, I will give it thee unto the half of my kingdom. He's willing to give up half to her. That's how she worked up, how stirred up she got him. The lust of her flesh. The lust of the flesh. So what does she do? She went forth and said unto her mother, What shall I ask? And without a beat, a heartbeat, she says, Ask for the head of John the Baptist. She's been laying in wait. She, she, her mom uses daughter to fix the situation. And she says, ask for the head of John the Baptist. And she came in straightway with haste unto the king and asked, saying, I will that thou give me by and by in a charger the head of John the Baptist. Now that verse is loaded with stuff going on in it. Watch what she does here. Mom says, daughter, you asked for the head of John the Baptist, but I want his head on a plate, on a charger, a plate. Now you think about where they're at. They're in a big birthday party. 
They've had course after course after comes in. Boom. The last course served is OJB's head, John the Baptist's head. The last course. And not just privately in this, but in front of who? Everybody. All the lords, all the high chief, all of those people. She wants the last serving at the party to be the head of John the Baptist. That's what the daughter asked. Why now? Why would the daughter ask that? Because that's what mom wanted. That's what mom told her. So her mother here isn't going to be, she's going to be vindicated. She, she, she's going to be, look, she wants to be safe. She, she wants, she's not going to be any of that until John is dead. She's not going to, until she knows. I mean, think about the, the presentation of that on a plate coming into the hall there. She doesn't, she is, she, she's not going to, she doesn't feel safe. Her revenge isn't complete. She hasn't been vindicated until she knows that John's dead. And the only way she'll know that is if she does what? Sees his head on a platter. Because what could old hubby say? What could Herod say? I killed him and yet never touch a hair on his head. No, we want proof. Give me a proof of life. Take a picture. We want proof of death. Take a, that's what she's after. And what you see there is the kind of hatred, the cruelty, the depth of it, that that political, social, because this is a social event, is going to go against the little flock. It goes against the, the word of God. And you see it right here. Now, the problem is in verse 26. And the king was exceeding sorrow, yet his, for his oath's sake and for their sakes which sat with him, he would not reject her. He doesn't want to do this. He knows who John is. He, and he knows he's wrong, too. That's what the guilty conscience. But what does he do? He does it anyway. Now, he uses the cop-out of, I gave my word. That's a cop-out. Just like Pilate is going to do with the Lord. He's innocent three times. He says it. He could have easily released him, but he cop. Why? He didn't do it because of the people, Pilate. But here, Herod knows who he is. He could have just said no. But the thing of it is, is notice what his word was to her. I will give you what? Not anything. I will give you half of my kingdom. He knows that John is worth more than half of his kingdom. He could have easily said, no, John's too valuable, pick something else. Because who does he know John to be? A just man, a holy man, a man of God? He could have easily said, nope, John's off the table, he's more valuable than anything in my kingdom. Pick something else. But he doesn't. He caves. His oath to her was, I'll give you... Uh, anything up to half of my kingdom, and he could have spared John right there by saying, John's too valuable. I need him alive. You pick anything else. You see that? He didn't do that. Verse 27, And immediately the king sent an executioner and commanded his head to be brought, and he went and beheaded him in the prison. You see that immediately? But wait a minute, verse 25, she said, By and by. By and by means what? Immediately. We have this misunder thing about thinking, well, not today, but maybe one day. That isn't what by and by means here. It's what? Immediately. If you look there at verse 25, and she came in, what? Straightway, with haste, and said unto the king, and asked, saying, I will that thou give me Again, by and by, and a charger. And that isn't maybe today, maybe tomorrow. That's right now. And immediately, she wants his head to be served as that final course in that convenient birthday. She wants it published. She wants everybody to know that who's dead? That agitator, John the Baptist. 
Because he's, what's he doing? He's out there preaching the word and he's convicting them. Verse 28. And brought his head in a charger and gave it to the damsel. Now think about that. And the damsel gave it to her mother. Just pick, get that picture. <laughs> they go and behead him, put it on a plate. They don't bring the plate to Herod. They bring it to the girl, the daughter. And the daughter takes it over and gives it to mom. And again, the cruelty, the evil. The, the, the evil of it. And it gets back to that issue about really in all of Scripture, even today. If you want to gauge the character of a nation, go look at the women. Go look at the moms and the daughters. That's why Paul uses that term in 1 Timothy 2 of shamefacedness. That's, that is a sentence unto itself. Shamefacedness. That's the issue of being embarrassed, having an embarrassment. And when the events within the nation doesn't cause the women of the nation to pause, to have an embarrassment moment, then the nation is lost no matter who's in controlling it. Well, same today. That passage in 1 Timothy 2, he's talking about the local assembly and the women of the local assembly being the conscience of that local assembly, saying, hang on a minute, guys. That's not accurate. Let's not do that. 1 Timothy 2, 9 is a verse. That's what you see here. Who's ruling, who's ruling Israel? Rome is, and you know what? The women are more vicious than the men. And Israel sits there and says, no, no big deal. We're not going to worry about it. So, she, so her mom has developed, brought to maturity her daughter to be just as evil as she was. And it not to be a problem. Verse 29. Now watch, th this is just... And when his disciples heard of it, they came and took up his corpse and laid it in a tomb. Look at what the believers did. They didn't go run and hide. They didn't go hide out in the cornfields. What'd they do? They walked right up into prison, demanded his body, and buried him. That's what they do with the Lord's body. They go in, they demand it, they get it, and they bury him. They don't... They don't run. They're not scared. See? Verse 29 is there really to remind the reader his disciples were not afraid of Herod or Herodias or the daughter. They still were willing to be identified with John the Baptist. And therefore, the message of Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. They didn't run. They don't quit. They're standing for and with the truth. Now, doing so could have gotten them killed in the moment. But it didn't. And again, the picture here for, that, for the twelve, they're going out. You're going to go out and have ministry. In the face of all this unbelief, we don't quit, we move forward, we keep going. And here's a picture painted under the death, the murder of John the Baptist. Why, what's going on, and how it happened. And what happens is, is you, little flock, you're going to come up against the religious opposition of your own people, but you're also going to come up against the political, the government, and society opposition as well, and you need to be ready for it. You need to be prepared. So the issue here, verse 30, and the apostles gathered themselves together unto Jesus and told him all things, both what they had done and what they had taught. And he said unto them, Come ye yourselves apart into a desert place and rest a while for there." were many coming and going, and they had no leisure so much as to eat. And then you have the feeding of the 5,000, and we'll get into all that next time, okay? The point is, is this little thing stuck in here with John the Baptist 
it's not a waste of pay, space on the page. It's designed to let them know, look, you've got the unbelief of your own nation, the religious system, but you're going to face a governmental opposition here. You've got to be ready for willing to take it, willing to stand, and willing to do. And he's pointing them to that tribulation period of time when they don't take the mark of the beast, when they don't do, and yet what's happening to them, they're getting beheaded, they're getting thrown in jail, they're constantly on the go, on the run, and so forth. And at no point do they forsake the truth. That's what verse 29 is kind of the little nail in the, in the head, in the coffin head, if you will. The condition that the, the nation is in, it is clearly represented by Herod and Herodias and the daughter. That vengeance, that hatred, that evil toward what God's word was, what it was saying, what it was designed to do, they didn't want it. So what did they do? They went and they killed John the Baptist. Now John the Baptist was a man sent by the Father. His death represents Israel allowing the murder of the Father. The Lord Jesus Christ, well, who is he? He's the Son, so they killed the Son. Acts 7, Stephen, a man full of the Holy Ghost, they kill the Holy Ghost. And Matthew over there, that the only unpardonable sin in all of the scriptures, if you will, Matthew 12, 31 and 32, is the blaspheming of the Holy Ghost. You can blaspheme the Father, it's forgiven. The Son, it's forgiven. That's why he says, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Changes it from murder to manslaughter, so there's an opportunity. But man, when they killed the... I, I, that thing in Acts 7 at the end, and Stephen says, don't put it to their account. And God's like, too late, it's on their account. <laughs> It's time to come back. Stephen is begging for it, but he doesn't have any power. If it was the son doing it, then there's power, but he he doesn't have the power. Three strikes and you're out, and that's what you see. So we'll pick up in verse 30 next time, kind of move move along here. But I, I just spend a moment with this stuff about Herod. And again, his guilty, suspicious conscience gets him. But yet he still could have, he knows who John is, could have been fine, said, nope, John's too valuable. You can pick anything else, honey. But he didn't. He caved because of the lust of his flesh got him. Because he saw the daughter, he saw mom, and he's like, Whoom, off he goes. Okay? All right. Well, we'll pick up in verse 30 and feed the 5,000 and walk on the sea and go do a bunch of other stuff. Okay? All right, Dearly Father, we thank you for the evening, we thank you for your word, and we thank you for all that we are in your Son. In your name we pray, amen.